Well, I'm available to start at right tackle. You can't see when I pull this on. Right. Well, there's not an even playing field. There's never been an even playing field. There never will be an even playing field. But... What shampoo do you use on your hair? You don't need to be Superman to play in this offense. You're listening to The Red Zone. Welcome, Badgers fans, to another episode of The Red Zone. We have uh, one of our favorite guests with us today, Zach Heilprin from The Zone. How are you doing, Zach? Doing great. Now, I don't think you know you have been on here since the preseason, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, do you want to, you know, do you want to start off by by gloating about you know being down on this team more than everybody else and and being correct? No, I don't, because then I'd also have to admit that I had the offense scoring 40 points a game, and <laughs> yeah. they are nowhere close. Being going nine and three or eight and four, you know, whatever ends up being, I still was very very wrong about what I thought this team could do. Uh, losing to BYU, I didn't see coming. Certainly losing to Michigan, I did, and, and we'll see what happens with Penn State. But yeah, the uh, I, I can't I can't escape what happened with the offense or what's <laughs> happened with the offense. Yeah, I know. I just I every time I I've, I've pictured that a lot in my head <laughs> us us debating it in the spring and then again in the fall whether this this offense will score forty points a game and um well you know you we win all some, you lose some yeah you can't win them all <laughs> so this so this team's not you know I, I guess you feel like you weren't really expecting this um, like you said with this team um, they still could finish nine and three which was what you predicted um, what do you feel like has been sort of the the biggest surprise to you is it just the offense in general or is it more specifically, maybe that the passing game hasn't taken steps forward. Is there, uh, you know, what specifically has maybe surprised you the most? Well, I think the slow start to the offense, uh, the offensive line, the slow start to the season. Now they've kind of picked it up here of late, and they're going to need those guys coming down the stretch. But it's the passing game, it's the offense, just the offense in general. I think, and I'm certainly at fault probably more than anybody else of drumming this up, but I felt like maybe, me personally, I paid too much attention to what happened in the Orange Bowl and not enough attention to what happened in the Big Ten championship game. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Sure. How, you know, Wisconsin, the inconsistency and just the not being able to, to dominate good teams. Um, and we took we took it for face value. We took what we saw in the Orange Bowl as what it was going to be all year, and we completely forgot about what happened in the Big Ten championship game, and that is completely, you know, on us I mean, <laughs> when, when we think about it. And I, you know... I remember talking after the Big Ten Championship game about, like, there's no way you can't have a quarterback competition, right? There's no, like, at, after what happened in the Big Ten Championship game, the way that Alex was up and down kind of all year, there's no way. And then after the Orange Bowl, it's like, there's no quarterback competition. You can't have a yeah. quarterback competition. But So I think there's a lot of things decided off that Orange Bowl, in my mind, that probably weren't accurate. Yeah, and I, I tried not to overreact to the Orange Bowl, but I also thought, you know, regardless of that, it's an offense that's returning 10 starters and a third year starting quarterback and, you know, all the talent at receiver. And, you know, at the time we didn't know Quintus Evis would be gone um, and things like that. But I, I mean, I just, I guess from, from Alex Hornibrook's perspective, it seems like it's been a hot topic the last couple of weeks. You know, I felt like he was, you know, pretty efficient through the first five games, had, you know, a really bad game against Michigan was, you know, really up and down in the Illinois game. Um, do you feel like he can he can kind of turn this around here, or do you feel like it's at a point now where, um, you know, do, do, does Wisconsin need to think about you know giving giving Jack Cohn a chance, or um, how do you kind of view it right now? Right now, I view it as Alex Hornibrook's their quarterback. He's going to be their quarterback this year. You know, what I mean, I'm, I think maybe towards the end of the season, because I think they made clear with the use of Danny Vandenboom that they want to redshirt yeah. Jack Cohn, and so he's not available until the final four games, whatever those final four games are going to be, whether it includes the Big Ten Championship game or not, um, they've decided they're not going to use him. So Alex Hornibrick is their quarterback right now, and he's going to be their quarterback uh, for the, unless he gets hurt. So I, I think he played at a level higher than what he's capable of consistently doing in the Orange Bowl. Like sure, He's yeah. proven to be incapable of doing that consistently. I think he's a solid quarterback, but he has too many weapons, at least in my mind, to be able to to, to not be able to move the ball as well as they should and well as well as they could and probably, you know, would if they had a quarterback on the level of uh, or a step above what, what Alex is doing. I, I'm trying not to be overly critical because guy's won a ton of games. He's had really good games. Yeah. The Iowa game was fantastic. He was really good in the second half against Michigan last year. Um but it just more often than not against elite competition, 
just hasn't looked very good. And so that to me is um, a measure of a guy, a measure of a quarterback. And I thought had, things had changed with the Miami game, but it didn't. That was it's horrible to say, but I feel like that was fool's gold. Because that was, I mean, that was a Miami defense that had played well and, and turn and turn turn other teams over a lot throughout the entire season. They did. It's almost as if they had a like some kind of a prize for turning teams over. No, well, I, don't, I don't know about that. I don't, I don't, I don't think I heard anything about that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so I, I think people do forget. You know, obviously it's easy to forget about his good games pretty quickly. You know, the Iowa game, he was fantastic in the second half of that, and that is a good defense on the road. Uh, but yeah, the last two games just haven't been good enough, and it's gonna go ahead. I, just, I have a question for you. When you look at Danny Davis, did you see Danny Davis after a couple of his the throws here last week? I did. Yeah. Him flip flip around and look back, and he looked frustrated as heck. Some of the balls that uh, were coming, and you could tell he was upset. Unfortunately, we can't actually ask him about it because, uh, you know, Danny Davis hasn't been available for obvious reasons, but um, I feel like there's some frustration there. And I saw saw A.J. Taylor jump up and down after a play as well where the ball didn't come his way when he was wide open. Um, I didn't see that one. Yeah. Uh, it was on a crossing route, and he was, jump- he, and he was jumping up and down on the other side of the field. And it was – like, I feel that there is some – not saying that there's anybody better to put in the game, but I certainly think there's some frustration there w- with the wide receivers looking back and uh, at Alex. And they're not making every single play either, right? The, the, I mean, the, sure, the wide yeah. receivers are making mistakes too, but um, the outward emotion is new. Yeah, I, th- I think it's I think it's pretty natural because if you look at that Illinois game, that the ones where Danny Davis got upset, it was like. It was a you know short pass where he was open and he just threw it either way behind him or it was just it was just a pass that he shouldn't have missed and he was way off on like the one in the and, corner of the end zone and it like sailed over his head yeah. like it wasn't anywhere close. You you could again I'm a, I'm an amateur body language uh, observer so I'm not going to sit here and say I know exactly what he was thinking, but that certainly didn't look good. And I I do think we have to be cautious too to to realize that. You know, there's definitely no guarantee that Jack Home would be better. We haven't seen him in an actual, actual meaning, meaningful playing time sure. his entire career. Yep. Um, you know, I, I felt like he made a lot of improvements this off season. Um, I do think, you know, if he got a chance, you know, m- maybe it would work out. And I also think, like you said, it does complicate things with him trying to redshirt him. But I do feel like if if Hornibrook continues to play poorly the next couple games, we definitely could see him because I think, you know, you look at if you're, if you're talking about the last four games, if you include the Big Ten title in that, that would be at Purdue would be the first game he could play in but but you know if if he were to play um a little bit earlier you could you could maybe you know a game earlier you could you could not play him in the bowl game possibly do some things like that I'm kind of reserved to the I'm kind of reserved to the idea that it's not going to happen yeah I, yeah I mean I don't think it is either I think I think Hornibrook like he normally has when he has a stretch of a couple of bad games he usually comes back with a good one at some point and and, and it, it kind of it kind of levels out, but you know, obviously he hasn't had the consistency you would like. But right, and I think it's probably worthwhile to. We were in the press box, but everybody else is at, you know outside and having to deal with the weather last week. It was miserable, right? I mean, it was it was horrible. So yeah, I think we can add that into a little bit. But I, again, when I when I think about his play, he's been solid, not out I, outstanding against Iowa, solid, bad against um, Michigan, BYU, or bad against yeah. Michigan. Um, their their games that they've lost, he's played he's played poorly. Um, but have a as have a lot of guys. I didn't. I'm trying not to criticize him so much to the point where it's all on him because it's not. But at the same time, there's balls and there's throws and there's plays that are left out on the field that are on are on him. And I think that um, you can't be overlooked either. You at the beginning of the podcast, you mentioned the offensive line having the slow start, and I feel like they have at least since the bye week, maybe after the BYU game, they have been uh, really dominant and playing extremely well. And I feel like their slow start is still kind of carried into midseason where a lot of fans feel like they're still not living up to expectations. But I, I don't know how other people – I haven't really talked to anybody about this, but I, I feel like I've, I'm have i a lot higher on the offensive line to this point in the season than, than most people are. At least fans, you know, they talk about how it's just not good enough up front. And I'm like, have you, have you watched the last three games? But – What's what? What's kind of your opinion? Do you feel like they're back to where they they should be after these last few games? It's kind of like the offense, right? Everyone's expecting such great things because they were the best offensive line in the country yeah. coming in, right? So, unless they put up 500 yards rushing every single game, it's somehow not good enough. And yet they've been over 300 and they're what three? They've been over 350 
in two of the last three Big Ten games. I mean, they, they went over that against Nebraska, went over that against uh, Illinois. Had they maybe stuck with the run a little bit better with Michigan and maybe a little bit a little bit different there yeah. too. Um, but I think they're starting to come around. And, you know, we all knew that they were dinged up in fall camp. I mean, there's a reason that they had so many different guys in there, different guys missed time. David Edwards, as Joe Rudolph mentioned on Tuesday, dealing with a shoulder injury that he played through the first few weeks of the season and now is starting to, um, you know, round into form. Bo Benchwell missed time. Tyler Biotic missed time. John Dietzen missed time. Like, I mean, they all missed time in fall camp for a reason. They were, they were dinged up. And now I think you're starting to see a group that is coming together. And, I mean, the only the only surprise, and, and I, I've been very high on everybody, but, you know, some of the Michael Dieter penalties are kind of like, what? Uh, you know, he's, he's had he's had a few more than you were expecting, yeah. you know. So, but otherwise, I think they've been very, very good. And if they're going to somehow finish this strong and you know win four of their last five, which is what's probably going to take to get into the Big Ten championship game, it'll be on these guys. And I think that they're starting to be that line that you can count on. I also feel like when you t- when you take a look at their slow start, I think it I think we have to add some context in the fact that we well we found out this week that David Edwards was playing through a shoulder injury he was playing really poorly the first few games yep. and that's 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 a a big reason why I, I'm, I'm assuming that's a big reason why he wasn't playing well to start the season and also I think if you go back and look at um for the BYU game for example the offensive line didn't play well in that game but I think a lot of the issues were um at the at blocking were at the tight end position they had just lost Sander Neville he went out I think on the first the second play of that game they weren't really prepared to uh to cope with that I don't think and you know they they hadn't started playing Jason Ehrman or Logan Bross as a blocking tight end. Um, I, I think Jake Ferguson has started to block a little bit better than maybe he was early in the year too. So I think that that maybe has a little bit of a factor too. For sure. I mean, there's a reason why they, <laughs> you know, moved uh, Cole Van Lannen, you know, played him at tight end last year yeah. when when uh, <laughs> when Xander Neville went down. He's a was a big part of this offense blocking wise, and you know they don't have the tight ends right now like Luke Benchwall may end up being that guy but he's he was dinged up coming you know he was dinged up too and um they just they don't have that dominant blocker at tight end right now and and so yeah you're that's why you have these other guys so um yeah the tight end spot probably an issue for sure um but in the run game and I know it's so cliche it only takes one guy to make a you know make a mistake and all of a sudden things blow up and it doesn't look good so you know you could have 10 guys doing the right thing one guy doesn't and it you know, it turns into what we see. But, you know, uh, Jonathan Taylor's because of how good he is, he's able to erase some mistakes here and there. But there were just – I think there were just too many early in the season. Defensively, we all expected a drop-off, but I feel like it's been a little bit more than, than maybe we anticipated, especially with the with the rushing defense. I think we kind of possibly underestimated a little bit how difficult it would be to replace um, the guys they did under the defensive line and an outside linebacker too – has maybe been a little bit below the level that, that we expected. Um, I, I looked up this earlier today, and I, I mean, they're 79th nationally against the run, which was actually surprised me. I hadn't checked that in a little while, and lower than I thought. But, did, I mean, are you kind of surprised that they've had so much trouble with the run? They have a walk-on, redshirt walk-on, and they have a former offensive lineman playing defensive line. I think that's pretty much all you need to say when you talk about the concerns they have and stopping the run. I mean, that's you're going from having three big time contributors in, you know, Connor Sheehy and uh, Alec James and Chico Yobasi to Matt Henningsen, who's working his butt off and, you know, is, you know, is I think maybe a good player at some point, or, you know, be a talented player at some point. And you got Caden Lyles, who was playing guard in spring ball, you know? So, I mean, that's that, that's that to me is as big a reason as anything. And Olive can only do so much. Um, and, and there's no one really behind those guys that they can count on. Bryson Williams has been in a little bit, but he's gotten moved around pretty easily. Um, you know, yeah, he may have to start this week. Again, I don't, it's, Wisconsin's offense better show up uh, <laughs> against Northwestern. I'll say that. Um, because, you know, in TJ Edwards and Ryan Connell, the, the reason they have as much success as they've had and all the inside linebackers have had over the last four years is because they've been able to run free largely. They've been able to get, you know, off. They don't have to shed nearly as many blocks when you have a talented defensive line up front. And, um, you know, it, the, the sirens should have gone off in fall camp when they had, you know, when Caden's starting and Matt Hennings is starting. I think those guys are both going to be good players. Caden not off its line, but that that should have set off, you know, alarms and not having Isaiah Loudermilk there certainly is a problem. Not having Garrett Rand there, obviously a problem. 
Um, but I think it, it starts with the defensive line more than more than the, the linebackers. I will say. I think especially day one, Caden Lyles is taking all the first team reps. <laughs> That's an alert. That's an alert. <laughs> and when when he was an offensive lineman like a month earlier. Alert! So, alert! Alert! Uh, you know, I, I think those guys are are are, are getting a, progressively better throughout the year, but it's still. I mean, they're still freshmen who just don't have the experience. And I, I actually think Olive has been, like, significantly better than than last season. But sure. it kind of gets overshadowed by the fact that the defensive line as a whole just isn't isn't up to par. Yeah, so it's, I, uh, I would agree. No, they when they can't – and, you know, it just – it just hasn't been good. You know, I don't know. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't know if I'm, I'm speaking the obvious, but we saw it in the BYU game, just the inability to – in that, that game was not great for the inside linebackers, you know, because yeah. their eyes were just – going all the wrong places instead of doing their job they were trying to do other people's jobs and it just it, it has not looked the way it has looked the few, last few years and I think that's a pretty obvious comment to make considering what they lost you mentioned the offense better show up against <laughs> against Northwestern what do you um uh defensively like do you feel like this is a Northwestern team that hasn't really run the ball very well since Jeremy Larkin retired and uh, I mean do you feel like the secondary is, is going to be really tested as well. I mean, it seems like maybe Northwestern will try to run the ball a little bit more the fact, because Wisconsin's not that good against the run, but uh, do you feel like they're going to go out there and, and try to pass it 40, 50 times a game and or this game like they have in the past and, and try to test the secondary? Put the ball in Clayton Thornton's hands and let him go to work. I wouldn't. Isn't that what you would do? I mean, obviously you yeah. want to run the ball, but um, Northwestern's played up or down to their – Opponents and and I actually asked Zach Vaughn about that this week. He said, you know, what what are you expecting? And he, and he said, you know, they when they play poor teams, they play poor, and when they play good teams, they play good. So they're gonna get uh, they're gonna get a really good shot. And Northwestern and Evanston has been just an absolute nightmare for Wisconsin much of the last twenty years. Though they did win the, in, in twenty sixteen, I'm expecting you know Clayton Thorson have the ball in his hands a ton and and get the ball out as quick and you know hit. Hit on the quick routes, and the weather probably is huge. This is the first time Wisconsin's playing on grass this year. Yeah, they've practiced on it. I was talking to Madison Cohn about it. He said they were slipping all over the place today because of the uh, the conditions, because it was wet out and it was cold, and that's what it's going to be like down at uh, in Evanston. So that's going to be a little bit of a change. I could see uh, I could see a big day for Clayton Thorson, largely because I think we've seen big days from a lot of quarterbacks so far this year. Um, you would hope that they have Dakota Dixon and Scott Nelson, though. I certainly would not be. Uh, surprised if they don't. They will have Fayon Hicks, so that's a good thing. But yeah, I mean, I their offense, as I said before, better show up and put up some points because uh, I think they're going to need to um, with what Northwestern's offense I think has a chance to do against Wisconsin's defense. Yeah, how many? I guess this is sort of a way to ask for your score prediction, but <laughs> but like, how many points do you think it's going to take to for Wisconsin to win this game? Yeah, I think at least twenty, twenty eight, thirty. You know, if, I think thirty one may win it, but it it'll be close. Again, I I have so little confidence in, uh, and I know it's horrible to say, but I just have so so little confidence in the defense uh, right now. And it's I think maybe we all got as as we tend to do got spoiled in and how great defenses are going to be, and they're just going to continue to be great when you're playing so many guys, so many young guys because of the injuries. You're seeing what that leads to, and I, I think Wisconsin's defense could be in for a long day against Northwestern. Do you think they're going to win? I do. Because I, I think honestly, I think they are going to go four and one down the stretch. And I think they're going to get in the Big Ten championship game. So they have to win this one because they're not going to win at Penn State. So you're sticking with your nine and three then? I am sticking with. I'm not. Yeah, I mean, I we've joked when we're not when I'm not officially on the record, like oh yeah, they may go eight and four, seven and five. We'll see. But <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, I'm going to stick with nine and three, and um, I because I still think that there is a good team here. I think there's a very there's a lot of talent here that can get it done. But it has to come together, and it has to come together like yesterday. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think um, I think I'm going to pick Wisconsin win this game, but it, I think it's going to be a really tough game. I think the line is six and a half, which seems high. Seems high to me. <laughs> Although you know Northwestern is coming off a three point win at Rutgers, and <laughs> they played poorly uh, against Nebraska the week before. So it's like you said, though, like they're a team that always plays down their level of competition. They, I mean, it seems like every game they've played has been play up or play down. I mean, they, their biggest, I think they're. Their biggest win is ten points. And I think that was on was that Central Michigan that they beat by or no was it a their biggest win is ten points. Their biggest loss is fourteen. I think they lost to Duke by fourteen. Yeah. But every other game has been right, right down to the wire. Um, you know, and so or they beat uh, Michigan State by yeah, ten. That's that's what it yeah. was. And that was and that game was they scored late to take the lead there and ended up going um, you know and uh, holding on. But yeah, that's uh, that team is 
whatever other team shows up, they'll play it to whatever that level that team is. I think that's been proven so far this year. Yeah, I, I think, I think there's still a, a a decent chance this team finishes eight and four. I think they could lose two more. I think the Purdue game is going to be really tough as well. Well, it looks a lot but, tougher today than it did last week at this time. Yeah, and you know, I I think I think maybe Purdue. I think they've got Iowa and. Um, another tough game, Mich- Michigan State maybe. They you, got two. You, t- you talking about Purdue? Purdue, yeah. They, they got, got two. T- t- yeah, two tough game. games in a row. Yeah, they lose one of those, maybe throws people off the scent, and then maybe then they upset Wisconsin. <laughs> right. <laughs> right, yeah. I mean, I, I again, I, I and I was asking the guys this week. I asked Taiwan Deal about. It. I said, you know, where's your confidence level? And I did not ask him to say anything, you know, over the top. Like, just said, you know, where's your confidence level? And you guys, it's a four team race. Where yeah, and he goes, I think. We have a we have a great offense. We have a great defense. We have great special teams, and ultimately, we're going to win the West. We're going to be the we're going to win the West. So, all right, if you say so, just straight up going to win the West. Yep. All right. So they're, they're they're I mean, there's you wouldn't expect anything different. But I did not ask him to say if they're going to win the West. I just said, where's the confidence level there? He he said it himself, and I think that says a lot about what uh, this team still thinks of its chances to to get it done. I could probably use that quote for my, my Saturday story this week. <laughs> Wish I was there. Yeah. Uh, thanks for joining me, Zach. You can follow him on Twitter at Zach Heilprin. And uh, you got to plug anything? I, I got to – well, can I, can I plug it? Well, we got yeah. the camp. We got our, our podcast, The Camp, with Matt Bernstein and myself, former Wisconsin fullback. And then uh, we also just started our uh, basketball podcast uh, with me and Jesse Temple of The Athletic, uh, talking Wisconsin basketball as that gets underway as well. You can find both those up on – Uh, iTunes and Google Play and every other podcast app you can possibly think of. So I appreciate it, Jason. All right, thanks for joining Zach. That's going to do it for this week. A big thanks to Zach for coming on. If you haven't yet, make sure you subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or Google Play. It just takes a second and it really helps us out. If you want to get a question in for our next episode on Friday, our mailbag episode, make sure you tweet me at Jason underscore Galloway and I'll get your question in for that. And keep visiting Madison.com for all of your Badgers football news. Thanks for listening.